welcome all on yeah the VFX Artists podcast and um, yeah um, I guess yeah we we are an in- independent podcast by artists um, and we generally bring on artists from all types of different VFX uh, departments and to discuss um, yeah how people are going into in the industry how they are they've, they've progressed through the their journey and just discuss all sorts of, of VFX um, topics and yeah so yeah today we just thought we'd use our platform to to discuss um, AI um, and the, the rise of AI art um, which is has been for the past six months I think has been quite popular um, and quite noticeable especially on LinkedIn um, and yeah we thought we, we can we would explore what the the impacts or the issues could be for for our industry and the creative industry in general so um yeah so here we are um coffee just just to follow that up with you uh, mm-hmm. real quick um should we be live on youtube as well we are live on youtube uh uh okay cool um yeah because i was just checking it on the side here and okay Okay. Okay. Lovely. It should be like, yeah. So let me just double share my screen. Just sharing the presentation that I made. Okay. Yeah. So AI in the VFX and creative industry. Uh, yeah, we're looking to explore the impacts, solutions, and issues. Um, I'll have to say that this podcast or this yeah, webinar is inspired by the Concept Art Association. Um, they did an AI town hall webinar on YouTube, um, just discussing this same um, topic. Um, and I think they did a great job just covering the, the basics of it and the whole topic. So I just thought to give them credit. Um, so yeah, today's outline, you just want to go through the impact and issues and solutions and possibly do a Q and A and just um, see what people think about it. Um, so yeah, um, maybe I might actually ask Simon because you, you might know more about it. So are you able to maybe tell us a bit more about maybe why, why we're here, um, <laughs> what AI art is and, and just the competition that we have on screen, I guess. So from from my point of view, uh, the reason I, I reached out to you and, and thought that this would be a, a good conversation is uh, I found I found myself talking about AI in broad terms uh, within uh, the company that I work for, Untold. Um, and just before we go any further, I just want to say that all opinions that I speak today are my own <laughs> and not my my companies. Mm-hmm. Um, I um, I kind of thought like there is a lot of speaking in our industry that needs to be done about this subject because especially with the visual a well you know I want to say AI that's a very broad term but AI ML neural network specifically and then diffusion as a as a subset of that diffusion in particular has been like something that has hit the visual industry uh, like a like a truck uh, in the last four or five months. Um, You know, when when Mid Journey really came out, uh, it was almost like, personally, I got the, I got a bit of a a strange feeling of like, what is happening here? After a few days, I realized, okay, it can't do this, it can't do that, we're safe here. But then as I saw the entire industry and the subject progressing and realizing how much like granular control people were getting, you know, every couple of weeks, um, this is moving very, very fast. And I feel like I can, I can talk to my small network of friends here and there as much as I can, but there's a broad discussion that needs to be had about this because it's going to affect us all. Um, whether we work in graphic design, concept art, uh, texture painting, uh, modeling, 
um, or rendering even you know there are there are diffusion plugins for for blender right now that 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 essentially tries to replace a renderer like it's not killing it but four months ago mid journey was not killing it at concept art but now it is so it, it's it i just thought why not why not talk about it with as broad of a you know a bunch of people as we can find um and just you know uh, i guess in many ways that you know over to you guys uh because I have my own opinions, potential fears, you know, I also think it's awesome. Uh, and you know, you can't ignore progress. Um, uh, so yeah, did, that's essentially why, um, you know, I kind of reached out to you coffee. So, yeah. Oh, you're still muted. Yeah, of course. I was, I was just saying, funny enough, because this is my first time going live, so I just realized I wasn't live. But <laughs> now we're live. Yeah, because now I we're had, live. Like, YouTube open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now we're live. Okay. But um, okay. Simon, say that all again. I could, I could say it again in a shorter amount of time. Uh, yeah. When I reached out to you, Coffee, uh, we, we. Uh, my main concern was that AI was progressing a lot faster than I initially thought it would when Midjourney first reared its head uh, about four months ago. Four months ago, Midjourney was impressive. It did images that were kind of amazing. One of them is still my wallpaper uh, on my desktop. Um, but you know, you could tell that like, an, uh, it wasn't doing anything. Uh, it was doing some cool stuff, but a concept artist needed to still be involved to make it make sense. Um, but then in the last four or five months, uh, you know, the control over what you can do, you literally just paint out a hand and try again, try again until the hand starts, you know, coming through. It's becoming actually useful. It looks like it's becoming useful. And I think there's a broad discussion to be had in VFX because it's not just going to impact graphic designers, concept artists, it's absolutely going to impact the daily job of texture artists. Um, if you look at, you know, some current, uh, push in by Nvidia, uh, model modelers, uh, lighting artists with blender plugins that are using diffusion as essentially the, the render engine. Um, it still is, it still seems slightly uncontrollable. But so did Mid Journey four months ago, and we're only talking about a four months gap from Mid Journey to being able to uh, use Dream Studio now, where you can put your own head as an anime character on, you know, on a prompt on a on a beautiful picture you, that you just created with a prompt. Um, so, I think all of us in the visual media and and VFX industry should be keeping a very close eye on this and more importantly, probably just talk about it um, instead of just keeping it to ourselves, keeping, keeping our, our anxieties or, or, you know, hopes uh, to ourselves. I think it's good to just put it out there and, and mm -hmm. talk about it and learn from each other. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, just cause you, we, I forgot to ask you to introduce yourself. Can you tell us? about oh, yeah. yourself and what you're really saying. that's okay uh i'm i'm the real time i'm a real-time supervisor at untold uh untold studios in in london um initially my job was to mainly take care of unreal and and real-time elements uh but i kind of found myself sliding into ai uh when it came out and um uh lately i've sort of been the point of contact for ai as well um at untold um, a good thing to mention, uh, as I mentioned that as well, is all these opinions that I will speak today on my own, <laughs> you know, I'm mm -hmm. not speaking for untold. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's what I do. That's what I am. Okay, great. All right. I'm just gonna 
represent my slide just for everyone that missed out. So let's see. Okay. All right. So for everyone that's just tuned in, um, welcome to the AI in the VFX creative industry um, webinar. Uh, we just today we're just trying to um, yeah discuss the impacts and issues and possibly find the solutions to how AI art could maybe influence or help our industry. Um, this webinar is inspired by the Concept Art Association, which previously did an AI town hall about a month ago, uh, discussing the same um, topic. And I found um, that topic very interesting and very insightful. So I gathered some inspiration from it. Yeah, so as I said, we're gonna touch on the impacts and the issues and solutions and possibly take some questions from the from the crowd. Um, we'll be hopefully touching base on these three companies um, of which Midjourney is on the left and Dali and yeah, Stable, Stable Diffusion, uh, the, the three maybe top companies currently. Um, so just trying to explain what AI art is, is basically how these platform works is you give the AI a prompt. So you tell it, you give it a set of keywords and or a sentence and give it a prompt and you ask it to generate an art, art piece. So this is um, a comparison between the results generated by Midjourney and Dali and Stable Diffusion using the same prompts, which is looking at behind the scenes of shooting the moon landing, Hollywood studio, 1969, backstage photograph, astronaut, actors and lighting. So all these three uh, platforms gave us three different results um, using the same prompt. Um, and as you can tell, you can, you can literally create any image from, from, from the, from the prompts that you give it. But, um, yeah, just today, we're just going to try and work out where the copyrights, where the data sets is, is being gathered and who owns the rights and all of that stuff. So that's what we're going to touch base on. This is this image on the left is an image that I tried to make on mid journey because I was looking to make a, a, an image for, for this webinar. So my, I, I went in and gave it a prompt of a photograph of an advanced technology humanoid, humanoid with a, with a female head, long hair, pretty in a dress, but with mechanical arms, holding a painting brush in, in left hand and pacing a palette in, in the other hand, standing in front of a cool deception. Um, yeah, but this is what I generated. And then on the right is what Carlo in, 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 the, in, the, in the guest, um, made and, and sent me and I just comparing the two, I felt his felt stronger as, 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 as an image and as a concept and as a final render. So I, I, I chose his over what I created using mid journey. Um, so that's something to think about. So yeah, just let's discuss what, how it will all impact us and yeah, possibly, yeah, let's, let's see how it goes. So yeah, Simon, it'd be great to, 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 to hear how, how you, you came across, um, AI art cause the past six months, I think I discovered it from you on LinkedIn. And it was a buzz for some time and everyone wanted to trial it and just let us know how you've been using it and what you've been finding it, finding about it and your thoughts about it. It'd be great. Um, sure. I think, um, maybe before I start rambling on about myself too much, would it be a good idea to, to have everybody introduce themselves? Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Um, I guess, uh, I I'm just going to go with what I see. Uh, the order that I see. So uh, Vlad, you're the first person I see 
Uh, hi guys, I work in the VFX industry. Uh, I live in the UK. Uh, I've worked for a lot of companies as a modeler and texture artist. I'm a sculptor as well, I sculpt. Uh, also a character artist, so. And as I said before, I've never used AI. I haven't generated a single image, so I'm really, I know how it is done in theory, but then in practice, I don't have the, the life experience when it comes right. to AI. But I've got a yeah, lot of you're... questions, I've got a lot of questions. You're, you're the very definition of VFX artist. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's great to have you uh, here. Excellent, um, Carlo. You're you're the next one on my list. <laughs> yeah. Hello, I'm uh, Carlo. I'm um, a three D three D artist, Blender artist, um, and I live in I'm a, in a digital nomad, but I'm, I'm in Valencia at the moment. Been here for uh, quite a while, so not much nomad. Lucky you. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's a nice place to be. I got stuck here during lockdown. And, moved so um yeah um and i come from a not from a vfx background i come from a an engineering background and i create mainly um b2b sort of uh content a lot of that a lot of my work is that not all of it so um that's the sort of angle that i'm i'm looking at whether you know whether marketing agencies will be able to do the stuff that i do for them on their own with this kind of technology a bit like Vlad, I've not got much. I've, I've used Mid Journey a little bit, and I sort of delved into it, and I saw the big sort of uh, rise of it, and, and wanted to get involved, but I haven't. I yeah, got bored of it really. I did a bit of dabbling, and then yeah, I, I think there's a lot to talk about when it comes to B two B, for sure. Uh, yeah, um, Tom, uh, you're the you're the next little image on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Tom Payton. I'm a writer, director, producer, and founder of a new company called Pigeon Shrine, which is based out of the West Midlands. And I'm a massive AI fanboy. Um, I, I suspect I might end up being the bad guy on this particular chat because a lot of what I'm doing is about completely rejigging the production pipeline, you know, and I think that the advantage that I've got as a fresh face company is, you know, I'm coming off the back of nine movies, but without a pipeline of product that needs to be finished. So I don't have a backlog of clients, a higher end whose work is already in an existing workflow. So we're essentially rebuilding the entire production pipeline from the ground up using AI assistance at pretty much every level, including concept art, VFX work, sound mixing, post-production, uh, you know, really kind of integrating all those elements. And, and the, you know, there's a real push for me to be able to bring production costs down and push the final product's quality up. And then in turn, perhaps change some of the culture around the way VFX artists are treated within the film world period. So yeah, I'm, uh, that's me. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> just uh, uh, full disclosure that Tom, um, I think we're we're getting a little bit of uh, a cut video. Uh, okay. Uh, it, it, we 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 can hear most of what you're saying, but sometimes it goes a little bit. Wah, uh, sure. So, let me. Uh, I'll swap. Yeah. <laughs> swap my internet. Cool. If you can do that, then yeah, that, that might work. Sure. Um, I guess in the meantime, uh, Jamie, uh, do you want to jump on and? Yeah, sure. Say hi. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Jamie Bakewell, uh, and I've been in the film industry since 2009, working on, as an artist, as a previous visualization artist on films like Jurassic World, James Bond, and Guardians of the Galaxy, and plenty of other big uh, movies. And I set up my own previous company, based in the West Midlands in 2018. Uh, and so, yeah, we're now a West Midlands based uh, visualization company also working on uh, Netflix movies and commercials and video game cinematics for, uh, yeah, uh, big, big titles. Well, don't forget the plug. What's the name of the company? Thank you. Uh, Simon. <laughs> uh, company called Big Tooth Studios based okay. in the West Midlands. Uh, so yeah, and 
not really dived too much, delve too much into AI, but just started using, you know, mid journey, uh, just like discord generator, just, just having a little play in, in spare times. But, um, a few of our artists on our team are, are obsessed with, uh, generating artwork of themselves as superheroes and all sorts of really, really cool, uh, stuff. Uh, and yeah, me and Tom, we, as of like a few months ago, we've been sending back and forth, yeah, lots of AI stuff and articles and videos and links and all that cool stuff. So it's very exciting um, and scary and curious and all sorts of uh, feelings. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, here we are. And uh, it's great the same for all of us. Yeah. Uh, welcome back, Tom. Uh, it's, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I, I fix it. I fixed it now. Is that is that better? I think that works, right? That's that's perfect. That's yeah, perfect. That's there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so yeah, thank, thanks, Tom, again, and and Jamie, thank you. That that's um, a previs. Actually, I think we we can talk about as well. Um, uh, you know, uh, we can talk about it later. But you know, AI for animation is happening as we speak. Um, quite properly um anthony you're the next beautiful icon on my page <laughs> gosh well, you're charming me simon um yeah i'm anthony <laughs> martin i'm uh, i work uh, at staffordshire university i'm a course leader and senior lecturer for concept art um, we have a concept art course up at staffordshire university with quite a lot of students and um i've been very interested in watching ai seemingly explode almost out of nowhere after the uh, over the last four five months or so uh, and i've been watching it with interest uh, i'm i'm fairly skeptical of it i but i'm also excited about some of the applications of it that don't necessarily affect concept artists uh, i'm kind of because i used to be i used to also do uh, vfx an animation before I started teaching at a university. I actually am not quite as convinced that AI imagery, and I'd like to call it AI imagery rather than AI art at the moment, um, I'm less convinced that it will necessarily replace concept artists as such. I think it will pose a big threat to illustrators uh, and that saddens me to a certain extent but um but i'm very interested in how it can be integrated into the nuts and bolts of uh, vfx work like you mentioned earlier uh about how it can um almost form a substitute renderer and deal with uh, compositing issues and tasks and and texture generation i the techie part of me finds that more interesting maybe than the actual generating kind of uh to what to me looks like fairly cliched kind of artwork but i'm sure we'll get into that uh, a bit later yeah yeah I, i'm sure we will actually i will take a quick note after you've said that i was just i will need to talk about this <laughs> 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 um excellent and uh justin well i know you because we work together at untold um but introduce yourself for for the other people <laughs> <laughs> that's right thank you so much um, yeah, I'm Justin Brown. I'm um, working as an effects artist at Untold Studios, and <clears throat> I'm mostly, yeah, I would I would say I'm I'm a generalist working mostly on uh, commercials and TV shows uh, in the past, and uh, yeah, before that I, I was I was go I was working on like as a compositor uh, and a little bit uh, as a DOP, um, but yeah quickly transitioned into like 3D and uh, that's my main focus right now. And uh, yeah, I, I'm in, in the uh, lucky position at Untold to uh, do a little bit with machine learning as well. I'm uh, integrating stable diffusion into Nuke um, and uh, yeah, oh, we, and we are doing like a lot of <laughs> progress there. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm super happy to be here. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> if I can add something to your introduction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd like to say that Justin has been on top of machine learning progress since uh, at least 2018, maybe 2017, when I first met him. Um, and he actually used um, some earlier machine learning techniques to make a, an amazing short film uh, where he actually used machine learning to mix and match and create mega scans out of mega scans. I don't quite understand how that all works, um, but Justin has been actually using a, a machine learning uh, hands-on for quite a long time. Uh, so as humble as he seems right now, he actually, <laughs> he's, he's deep, he's deep, deep into it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cool. Um, and then, yeah, uh, I guess, uh, Coffee, you, you, you were just asking me to introduce myself. So, yeah, I'm the real time soup at Untold. And um, uh, the way that I got into machine learning was um, initially out of interest, uh, talking to Justin years ago, looking at, I, I started a motion capture studio um, a few years ago called the Mocap Studio uh, in London. And <laughs> very creative name i know um and it, it's good for google hits <laughs> um and and while we had this uh, motion capture studio one of our main um gripes i guess one of our main issues was motion capture cleanup um and motion capture cleanup uh, traditionally has just been a manual job you know you bring mocap into motion builder or maya and you know Back then, KinFX, Houdini didn't exist, or Houdini existed, but KinFX didn't. Um, so, you know, I was very interested into uh, in seeing how machine learning could help that. And back then, there was already quite a few efforts and a few startups that were um, even asking us, like emailing us as a as a motion capture company, asking for data. Uh, just saying, can you just send us data, like animation, mocap data, like anything you've got, can you send it to us? And, you know, back then we were like, we're trying to run a business. So we're like, okay. And what do we get in return? And they're like, oh, you can get like a, a, a one month trial to our, you know, new amazing motion, uh, AI motion capture cleanup solver. Um, so at the time we said, thanks, but no thanks, because uh, these companies we had no connection with, we didn't understand what they were doing, but, um, I was interested. I was like, okay, let, let's see what that really means. Um, and it turns out that, you know, a long time before Disco, Disco Diffusion came out and Diffusion in general came out, uh, machine learning was, was already doing pretty well with simple data. So simple data is parameters and numbers, basically a spreadsheet, you know, machine learning, like writing some machine learning to manage a spreadsheet um, is actually pretty, pretty easy there, I say, um, because there's not a lot of numbers to play with. Uh, and motion capture is the same. Yeah, you've only got a certain amount of bones. All these bones have got a rotation value and a translation value over a bunch of frames. It's basically just a big spreadsheet. Um, and so at the time, it felt like somehow it was within my reach to actually do some of that myself. Um, there were a few tutorials out there, a bunch of GitHubs. Um, and I started kind of like getting deeper into like, well, can I actually write some training to clean up the motion capture that we generate? Um, and then I met Justin, um, who uh, kind of started telling me about uh, how much harder it was than I thought it was. <laughs> um, so at that point, um, you know, we, we, I didn't really personally push uh, the machine learning for motion capture cleanup much further. Uh, I just kind of moved on to uh, running my business. <laughs> um, but it was, it wasn't until, honestly, it wasn't until mid journey reared its head that I, you know, I, I had almost forgotten about machine learning at that point. Uh, you know, I was like, yeah, it's cool. It seems 
really hard to get anything done. Then Mid Journey came out and just, uh, you know, and the open models like Disco Diffusion or, you know, the uh, Lion 5B uh, model that uh, Disco Diffusion was based on started coming out. And then it's almost like about four or five months ago, there's like somebody lit a match and just set fire to this this whole business or industry um, with progress just happening at breakneck speed. Um, yeah, so now I'm just running with everybody else, just, you know, trying to keep up to date with all the progress that's happening. I'm on all the subreddits, I'm on all the Discord channels, and still, like, the information is just overwhelming. I, it's very hard to keep up with. Yeah, sure. So um, are you able to tell us a bit about your integration into your pipeline and how you use it? And yeah, maybe what you worry about. I'll, I'll jump in very quickly about how I've used it. Uh, and then I'll let Justin talk about how we're looking at integrating it into our pipeline. Um, how I've used it was for... Um, uh, there's, there's a WWF, not the wrestling, but the World Wildlife Foundation, um, commercial, uh, which will come out in, I think, uh, two days from now. Um, and that was a director, uh, who is famous for using cutting edge technology in strange ways. So a few years ago, he did a short film or, or commercial that used um, depth sensors to create very kind of interesting shapes and form and stuff. And so that director is very in tune with, you know, emerging tech and, and really enjoys using emerging tech uh, to, to, to do his work. Um, and he uh, approached us to do this uh, WWF uh, TV commercial. And at some point I <laughs> made the mistake of going like, oh, maybe we could do this with AI. And he was like, AI, I like that. <laughs> Let's talk more. Um, <laughs> And uh, Disco Diffusion was um, kind of a thing at that point. Um, Disco Diffusion Warp. So there was a Disco Diffusion Warp, which is a fork of Disco Diffusion that used uh, optical flow to deform uh, the Disco Diffusion stuff. Uh, so make it animated, like an easy way to make it animate without like just flickering. Um, so we just started using that and it was a weird three or four weeks of just generating, <laughs> generating random stuff by typing prompts mm -hmm. like fire, death, uh, fish, dying skulls, you know, like just mm -hmm. words, you know, and we had supervisors jumping in going like, type this sentence in and let's see what this does. And it was like a very strange workflow because as, as VFX artists, we're used to controlling every single pixel that we make in, and, mm -hmm. and massaging it into place and doing, and this one was more like, here's a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> let's see what, what we can do with it. Um, and luckily we had really talented compass, uh, to turn my absolute insanity output uh, into something cohesive. Um, so that's when we used it first as, as a studio. Um, Justin is actually, uh, the one take, taking the, the torch in terms of, uh, implementing it in a serious way, not, not in a like hacker in the bedroom kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> Still doing that though. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, Justin, like have a, uh, you can, you can probably like talk about the new stuff that we're doing at the moment or. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, I mean, um, in general, I think like, uh, the opportunities for AI are quite broad, I would say already with like the existing setups. Um, I think there are a lot of, uh, different departments that can benefit from them. So, um, basically what what we're right now doing is integrating it mostly into nuke um but we have like um like a system that can i mean we are running all all the stuff locally uh, i've seen like a lot of plugins already out there 
for Photoshop, for example, that um, uh, communicate with a server running somewhere uh, on the internet, basically. Um, and we we are actually using like uh, like our internal hardware and uh, running an internal server, uh, which um, right now is just like running on uh, on the machine um, the users yeah using and uh it's it's connecting with different software so for example right now it's it's just uh, nuke and Houdini, uh which can talk to uh, to this stable diffusion server and uh it it's it's accepting prompts uh you you can for example uh load an image in uh select an area and type something you want to change and uh, it generates it quite quite quickly on the fly uh, loads it back in and it's it's uh, we, we're trying to make it as seamless as possible to really uh, iterate fast iterate quickly with like uh input images or like you you draw something in you quickly with with the paint node and um you you feed that back, uh, in into the um uh, into the server and uh, it gener uh, generates something uh, <laughs> that you can use so um that's basic. That's the idea <clears throat> behind it. But um, uh, we got really good feedback from from the compositing team. Uh, we we're just uh, trying to roll it out and giving like people the opportunity to test it um, and uh, collecting feedback for that. So that's that's roughly at the stage where we are. Um, and um, I mean plans for for getting uh, getting different departments uh, into the stable diffusion thing as well uh we we have some progress on the texture generation part for example in houdini you can uh you you can use uh the server to generate some textures uh for for objects you have uh or um what what we're gonna do is <clears throat> implementing something that's similar to the blender uh, rendering tool uh for houdini so we um yeah. have have something that works for for our pipeline because uh we we don't really use blender that much um and uh yeah yeah that, Tom, that's i i'm oh, sorry yeah so, sorry if, uh, i i just i was curious about uh tom mentioned that you were also a writer and director is is that right yeah yeah that's correct so my background is in Production, um, you know, I've produced, directed, written most of them and delivered to international buyers nine movies at this stage. And uh, so the, the, the reason I was really curious to hear about what you had to say is uh, I have a, a, a friend who's a director and, you know, when Mid Journey came out, I sent him an invite and he just went crazy, just all of a sudden said, like, I can make the posters I can make the, 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 all the pitch decks that I wanted to make that I always had to kind of call upon a friend or a favor or, uh, you know, somebody to kind of help me out to visualize what I'm trying to say here. He's just been so happy because he's just been able to like, just generate these pitch decks just all yeah. on his own. Um, how, how do you feel about it? Is that something you've been doing as well? Or? Yeah. I mean, look, so, I mean, my, my, a little bit like Justin, really, you know, I've been kind of on the AI tip for a very long time. I watched a, uh, a short film called Sunspring, which was written by an AI back in 2016. They got Thomas Middleditch to come and star in it. And, you know, it was kind of like this bizarre Shakespearean. It didn't make any sense, but it was kind of entertaining. And, you know, at the time, it was kind of this jokey product that everyone was like, haha, look at the silly AI short film but i remember thinking back then okay this is this is the future for all departments and so i've kind of made it a sort of a vested uh you know part of my journey to stay on top of integrating ai as you know whenever we could really um you know and it hit the sound world first you know it became super quick and easy for us to use in terms of sound cleanup and bringing those costs down you know, we've started using it within composing and, and music departments and I'm working with my composer to speed up turnaround times using AI. Uh, just recently we did, uh, you know, we filled in ADR on a movie that we just delivered that flew through QC 
Uh, and we never actually got the actors back. We just trained the the voice models to to replicate them. And then I essentially did the performances, filled in the gaps, and you know we flew through. And the, the thing with AI is it kind of lets you do this in all kind of departments. And I think you know with the visual element stuff, you know Mid Journey especially, a lot of filmmakers are finding the, the problem when you're trying to get something off the ground, right? Like until, before a product ever gets to you guys, where there's a locked budget. You know, uh, and we can say, oh, well, this is how much we've got to spend on this. There's there's years of front loaded work where you start with most of the time indie filmmakers start with absolute zero, you know, and they're just trying to be their own hype machine and convince people that they should put some development funds in. And then that, that development fund gets spent on people like Vlad and, and Carlo, uh, you know, but then you're already like nine, 10 months into a process by that point, And most of these producers and directors are now eating pot noodles and starving to death and end up quitting and the project never gets going. And all of a sudden mid journey empowers them to be able to put that out there. One of the interesting things we've done this year is, you know, I've got three projects that are all about to go. They're all now funded. They're all ready to go. And nearly all of them attach their cast by generating images of that ca of that actor inside the character and then sending it to them directly. You know, like there was one guy, I won't, I won't say any names, but you know, I'm on a Zoom with this quite famous actor trying to talk him into it. And while I'm talking to him, I'm generating stuff on Stable Diffusion, like down here in my lap. And then I'm sending him, like, oh, check this out. And I'm, I'm certain that's what made him join the project and we're funded for that. So, you know, this stuff is, is really powerful just in terms of getting your project off the ground in the first place. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad, um, cause there's a lot to unpack, uh, there. Um, uh, I, I guess n number one, um, you know, like you did mention at, at the beginning and, and look, I, you know, we all understand here that like starting your own film or your own project, your own production, you know, there's no money there. It's, it's just blood, sweat and tears and belief in yourself like there's there's absolutely no doubt about it unless you got really rich parents <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, but it's it's one of those things where you know um initially yeah uh back a, a while back you would have had to go to vlad now i imagine that vlad is just fine and, and yeah. <laughs> you know, he's, 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 he's got plenty of plenty of work. Not sure about but, the future. <laughs> but we have to remember that there are younger people, um, juniors, that may have been happy to also put blood, sweat, and tears into doing the concept art for mm. for your film, yeah. and and may not have that in. So, no, I think it's about repurposing and you know. Yeah, I think it's about repurposing. Like, you know, that's part of what we're that's part of what we're trying to address is that, you know, I, you know, I, I know better than anybody, you, you know, I, I never even went to university to study filmmaking. I started my production company when I was 20, probably like 15, 16 years ago now, and just hustled it into existence. And I never want to kind of cheat anybody out of work. And, and I guess it's about how you repurpose people. So, you know, a big thing me and Jamie have been discussing is the potential for using AI in animation. And, you know, where, where I would now come to Vlad, where I would have used him in that, in that sort of initial stage to sell the project. Now what I would do with a concept artist like Vlad is, you know, I might use Stable Diffusion to actually fund the project. And then I will bring it to Jamie with that development funds and we'll grayscale out the entire film. And if it's animated, I'll then, I'll then hire Vlad to come and essentially concept art the first frame of every shot and then feed it back into, into a, you know, an AI model, you know, like something more advanced, but along the lines of EB Synth and, and essentially take his concept art and create AI assisted animation where the delivery times on them are tiny. And actually that lets us go, well, now I pay Vlad more. One of the big things that me and Jamie have been discussing that I'm insistent on that I think AI will let us do is start to treat VFX artists like above the line talent where we're going, actually people show up to see these products and buy them for your work just as much as the cast name. And the fact that VFX artists are normally right at the back end of the production after we've messed it all up and, and 
the shoot didn't go the way it was supposed to. And then we're relying on the VFX artists to essentially come in and patch it up. But with the smallest amount of money, AI lets us change that workflow uh, and essentially go, well, now we can put more funds into the VFX team themselves and treat them, you know, like we would above the line talent. So that's kind of what we're trying to do with it. Yeah, that that's super interesting. I, I get it. Like, you know, you, Vlad doesn't have to. And sorry, Vlad, that we're using you as a, <laughs> as an example. In this. A, <laughs> but no, let's say close. young, young Vlad, young yeah. Vlad doesn't have to work for you for free in the first couple of years no. uh, to get the project off the ground and AI can do that. And then you can pay current Vlad his actual wage to do proper sure. work on the film that yeah that makes a lot of sense it's actually a really good angle to it yeah. and at like and at faster so speeds as well that's the thing sorry yeah how do you feel about that vlad since we've mentioned you so much <laughs> just on a side note i'm i'm a 3d artist but that doesn't change tom's point actually yeah yeah it goes for everybody yeah. uh i mean as Tom said it's it's all about repurposing. Yeah. I know I'm uh, not I'm not gonna be able to stop it. That's it. It's like a snowball. That's it. It's unstoppable. So we'll have to just adapt, does it? Yeah. But to go to maybe to Anthony who's teaching um young concept artists who are just kind of starting out in the industry. Um I I I guess I, I I'm old enough now that I'm I'm probably not quite 100% in touch with what it means to be young and starting out today. <laughs> um, mm. So maybe Anthony can like enlighten us on 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 that front because, as you know, as we just kind of highlighted with Tom, is that you know maybe entry jobs might be potentially more scarce or I don't know, um, Anthony if. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, it, it was all, it's already difficult for young people to get a foot in the door as a concept artist. I think concept art in particular, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, there's a lot of competition anyway in the VFX art kind of world and, uh, and games art kind of world. Uh, but then with concept art, I think the competition is even, even greater because there are just inherently less concept artists working on a game or a film than there are 3D artists uh, or compositors or lighters. And um, so I think that some of them, some of them are very excited uh, and they're, they're, they're wowed by it. They're wowed by the possibilities of it. Uh, and they want to explore it. They want to see kind of, kind of uh, what can it generate? I think that almost in the sort of, um, almost in that sort of uh, pure, joyous, young way of wanting to see wow, I'm in the future and it feels like a science fiction novel. Um, what, what can this stuff generate? But then there are others who, who are legitimately worried because they think, uh, what, what is the point of learning to draw, uh, learning to, to, to use something like Photoshop or, or Blender or, or whatever, uh, learning to develop an eye for art direction when uh, a, a client, wh whether they might be the actual... Uh, producer, uh, director of the game, or an art director, production designer of a film, can just go, well, I don't really need you anymore to do this yeah, part I think we of the job. And so they were a bit scared of that. Uh, sorry, Simon, were you going to say I something? We, uh, sorry, I think we, we lost you for about 10 seconds. Oh, no, oh, no. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm not sure where I got. Uh, yeah, so there, there, are, there are students who are excited about it. Uh, and they're probably at the moment in the minority, but they, they are genuinely excited uh, about it because they see it as, uh, uh, yeah, as an exciting thing. You know, they, they feel like they're living in the future. Uh, but then there are others who are genuinely fearful of it because they think that um, what is the point of me doing three or four years worth of university education to, to learn how to to draw, to learn how to paint, to learn how to design when, yeah. um, when, 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 when a client, uh, it doesn't matter if it's in the games or the, or the film or the TV industry can, can just 
uh, come up with a, a particularly good prompt and, and get what they want. Uh, I try and reassure them. I think that, as I mentioned earlier, when I introduced myself, I think for an illustrator, it, gen it, it is generally a, a really scary time because illustrators, they're, they're operating uh, on, on a scary kind of level of generally freelance kind of uh, level, and they have very short deadlines and they're, they're often, uh, their work is often not massively appreciated or they're given the credit. So we've already, I remember seeing that there was uh, the, during the Alex Jones trial when he was being, uh, being taken to court and sued. I think it was, I think it was the New Yorker or the Atlantic um, had a fairly high profile AI generated illustration uh, topping their, their kind of um, their article. And, and it looked perfectly good. It was fine. You know, it, it, it worked. And, and I think a lot of illustrators probably looked at that uh, and were thinking, oh my God, you know, this is, this is it. I can see the writing on the wall. I, I think the nitty gritty of concept art is a bit different because Concept artists will do illustration kind of work, but that's not really necessarily the actual majority of what they do, uh, especially in a in a games company. Uh, they will have to work with layout artists and level designers and, and make sure their designs make coherent sense in 3D uh, and are consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think at the moment, AI has a little bit of trouble doing that. I think um, the, one of the telltale signs sometimes of AI, AI art is it can look really cool, it can look really amazing, but there's a certain mm, sloppy messiness to it sometimes that makes you think, what, what, if I ask for that exact same scene, but from 90 degrees and then 180 degrees, how how rock solid could it make, make that? I, and I'm sure though it probably will do eventually. I think that this is something that uh, is, is inevitable now that yeah, someone, I think maybe I can't remember who mentioned it. It is like the cat's out of the bag, you know, the, the, the it, it's happening whether we like it or not. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, wh wh when it comes to teaching students, the, it, if they ask to use AI art in their assignments, then I'm okay with them doing that as long as they're clear and open that they're using it. And to be honest, I don't think at the moment a student could really hide that they'd used AI art because it would be a bit like, um, here's my... Here's my here's my drawings here, and they're really sloppy and terrible, and you know the perspective's awful. But then, oh look, here's my final product, and it's this perfect rendered, uh, amazing, prize-winning kind of image. They, I don't think they could get away with that. Uh, I'm kind of yeah. I, I'm I'm kind of all over the place in terms of I'm I'm very impressed with the technology of it, uh, but I really don't like the business model of uh, of these companies. I think um, they're 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 yeah. very sketchy. Some of them. Yeah, that's something we could uh, move on to, um, unless anybody else uh, wants to jump in uh, after Anthony to, to add anything to it. And like for, for me, I, I'm kind of new-ish to it, so I haven't really dived into it too much um, to really know too much about it, but I guess... From a previous side of things, it's quite interesting because, um, you know, like like Tom said about sort of, you know, because previews, there's all sorts of levels of previews. It sort of can be grayscale. It can be high-end previews. The client wants super high quality or they want just like a grayscale cubes, but they want to see something, but it's not final, but it kind of is there to, you know, paint a picture and, and tell, tell a story. Um, I can see, you know, benefiting the sort of speed because we, we, we're going back and forth with changes and, you know, tweak this, change that. Um, what's it look like, you know, over here? And when Tom said about sort of grayscaling the whole scene um, and then being able to just paint um, a concept frame and then generate that through the whole thing, I mean, that's time saving. We're all about saving time and being efficient, not that efficient is always good, but um, it's very interesting. So I'm kind of just here to observe, yeah. ask questions and just find out more. And if there's any questions about previous and how we can see it, you know, in the future, then I'll happily answer it from a, from a visualization uh, perspective, but yeah. Yeah. 
um yeah i just want to just wanted to chip in though about um if i could yeah if i could just chip in about the actual i think the thing is concepts artists especially like students that are learning now they shouldn't in, in my opinion right like it's one thing being able to type in oh a wizard with a hat on right and generate that image but actually, you know, the, the, the art of prompt creation is in itself rooted in an artist's knowledge. You know, like the more detailed a prompt becomes, you can, you can always tell when somebody, you know, who is a very talented artist with a, with a deep knowledge and respect for where they learn their art from. You can always tell when that person uses AI. Their prompts are so complex. They're so informed that all of a sudden that there's nothing ropey about that AI image. And then when you give it to somebody who doesn't have that artistic background and they just type wizard with a hat on, you know, that's when you get that traditional sort of AI look. And, you know, I kind of feel like there'll always be value in that knowledge that, you know, you know, student artists possess, you know, even if it's, even if it's, a you know, you're still paying them that traditional day rate, but they're generating you thousands of versions of what you need using their knowledge base to produce that for you. But I'd still pay them for that skill set because it's one that nobody else on the team possesses. And I think that that's something to, to take into account. I don't see AI art coming along and, and stealing that bottom layer from people starting out. I think it, it kind of gives them that window to apply the knowledge that they've learned in a, in a much broader way that gives the client more choice. Hmm. Yeah, that knowledge... It, without getting the amazing image, the knowledge needs to be there to get to that point. Yeah, I would just, like a to say, just a question. So, so obvious. Yeah. The, the comparison like, of un, no, someone without the knowledge and then someone with the experience and knowledge of, of you know film composition, what looks good, what looks bad, to generate a really good image. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you were. Sorry. Just a question: Are the new young students? concept artists and artists in general have the drive and inspiration just to study hours and hours of like a composition drawing just to get to that point to use this just to generate images by typing words are they going to have that inspiration that drive that's the question i, I, don't, I, I, get, I, like... I don't think many of them will <laughs> Yeah, I'd like they to won't see that as a appealing as... future for themselves. I think that it's interesting when you talked about the yeah. complexity of prompts, uh, and I've been looking at a lot of the prompts that generate some of the more um, impressive kind of images, uh, that, and they're using knowledges of lenses. Uh, so they'll often be describing um, the specific f-stop of that they want for a, of an image. So it's almost like the language of a cinematographer or a director, um, rather than I think a traditional artist who, who who will think about depth of field but they won't be thinking about it in the way that a, a photographer or a cinematographer or a director kind of thinks about it so i i, I actually see it as being something that, that directors and cinematographers uh, maybe storyboarders will that they'll take to it very well i think that the, the the younger artists who are learning that traditional historical uh visual art kind of method where they learn about value and, and composition in a way that they they don't necessarily describe in a verbose way. They, they're, they're artists, they, they feel it. Uh, you, you can describe a certain amount to them, but then a big part of it comes with their repetition of actually practically doing mm -hmm. this kind of art. And so they begin to feel it. So I think that, um, yeah. I, I think, think that a lot of, I don't think many of my students would would think I want to do this course so that I, I would be a really good AI prompt kind of person. Uh, I, I almost feel that's something that a film course, uh, it's, it feels more of a film kind of thing rather than a concept art kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess, I guess there's always the argument of, of kind of like, you know, you can deploy image to image, you know, it's like, let's say, you know, Carlo does me an initial design and I go, wow, I love it. You know, uh, I need I need an entire pitch deck of this. You know, he can essentially train his local model on his particular style or on that particular image and, yeah. and generate the rest of them at the back of it. And it's kind of like trying to find that out that how we marry the two. I, I find well, I find that aspect it... of it the the way you can feed your own stuff into it uh, and get variations 
far more interesting than trying to just get a pretty picture uh, or, or, or just a cool image out of a good prompt. I, I find it way more interesting, yeah, to, to think, yeah, what, I, what can I, I do with my you. own stuff if I want to build in all my own stuff I, to get a new idea I, that would feel like me? I think that kind of opens up the door uh, to talking about all of the artists that are currently in all of the diffusion models that we use who have never agreed on being oh, used in those yeah, diffusion models. Exactly, yeah. So yeah. there is definitely uh, a very, very big question to be asked there. Um, mm. I think that you know, you know it's an opt-out process at the moment, uh, and it should be an opt-in process. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think Maybe. even when you opt out, you're, you, you will be opting out of future data sets. Um, and, and when you will you probably still out, be in the ones that are still out there at the moment. What do you opt out of, though? The real yeah. question is, as a concept artist right now, mm. a lot of my friends are. I have some work on ArtStation myself, actually. Not a lot, but some. Um, you don't opt out because the reality is Midjourney right now, the current model that it uses, if you mention a specific ArtStation artist by name, you yeah. will get a style that yeah. is reminiscent of that particular artist name. Mm -hmm. That means that Midjourney has had to scrape ArtStation. Yeah. Um, that is against the terms of services of ArtStation. Yeah, I, I was looking into this. So, I can't speak. I don't know the data set that, that Midjourney uses, but I know that the Lion um, data sets, if you read their FAQ about copyright infringement and, and how they how they kind of scrape these images, they, they make fairly clear that they're not actually scraping the image themselves. They're scraping a URL that points to the image. And they, that I have to- That sounds like an NFT. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're a lot like that, yeah. Um, and and I, and I read in the FAQ, it, it, there's a certain amount of mealy mouthedness to their description about how they, they try and reassure you, I suppose, that that it's okay. You know, it, it's not really, it's not like we're stealing their art, but at the same time, we, our system just points to the, the location on the internet where that art is, you know, it never downloads it. Um, so I, that that kind of aspect to it, I, I think, I, I don't really, I don't really like, it feels like it brings me up to uh, the other point of, um, there's, uh, yeah, there's dance diffusion, isn't there? I think it's that they're, they're doing, a music dance music version of AI generated art, and they're very clear with music, very clear that they will only use uh, Creative Commons copyright free music or music that's specially commissioned, because they know that yes. music publishers will will definitely uh, uh, come down on them like a ton of bricks. But they, but they already have actually. Yeah. I, I read an article recently that they, they already have lawyers yeah. uh, geared up to to fight for them. The thing is, is the music industry has a, a, a representative body yes, that yeah. can and will fight for them. Yeah, visual yeah. artists don't. They don't. And, um, and you can totally see why why that is. I mean, the music industry comes from big major publishers where where licensing and royalties uh, and it, the legal framework is all there. And artists work for record labels that then get published. Whereas whereas visual artists tend to just work for themselves. They might be either hobbyists or they might be freelancers. There is no massive union um, that can can support them. So, it, it, of course, you know, there's no incentive really for the for, for for these kind of AI companies to sort of proactively go, yeah, let's make it opt in. Even though, even though I think that's silly in a way, because I think there would be many visual artists who would love to opt in, who who would who would be very happy to contribute to it. But of course, there wouldn't be two billion. Um, artists to, to to do that they, but then know, everything would look like anime yeah well well that's another <laughs> thing isn't it it's um i think um I, I, it wasn't me but I, I read someone who they wondered if they could break ai art by just typing ai into into mid journey what happens when you type ai into mid journey and the the, the four different images that they got uh were were basically the same white sexy pretty woman um, who looked vaguely cyborg, but with vaguely Asian kind of figures. So, so you, you know that this, it's like input output. It, it's, it, it's being steered towards a certain 
demographic. I, I think uh, one of the examples Kofi had in his slideshow was old man. Now, nowhere in, in the description did it say white old man, but all the three images were, were white old men kind of coming out of it. So I, I think that there's... Um, it, it, these things are being steered towards a certain way as well. They're being aesthetically judged. The data sets are being aesthetically judged. <laughs> I mean, let's let's all be thankful that all of these AIs didn't scrape 4chan. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be surprised if they had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they probably did. I mean, they are no, non-curated, I think. So uh, it's basically <laughs> the collection of everything. And I mean, this is maybe something that's, yeah, that's capturing this kind of uh, thing as well. And um, just wondering, um, what, what I wanted to ask you is, um, do, do you think, uh, would you treat like the AIs as like something, uh, yeah, just like a compression algorithm, taking all those uh, 4 billion pictures and mm. interpolating between them? Or are you... Are you more like, because no one is, if, if you're opening uh, your browser and going to ArtStation, you, you can look at any image as a concept artist and use it as reference. Mm. Um, would, would you treat it the same? Or, uh, in, uh, I mean, I'm interested in your mind, does it feel like the same? Or is it, is it more, uh, more as an interpolation between existing stuff? Because as a concept artist or uh, as a director, you usually you, you want to you, you have your own feelings, your own uh, real world anchored um, uh, experience that you try to get into into your art. You you have like mm. an intention that's that's going into yeah. the art. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's no and, there's, there's no intent is there at all happening yeah. with with AI yeah. at all. Uh, and I think you you're right. It it in some ways it is a lot like the front page of art station in a way, which I think is mm. ironic and sort of um, not surprising in a way is, is that it, it's scraping lots and lots of stuff. So it's, it's smearing out and you're getting a kind of an averaging view of, of what oh. is popular, what, what people are generating uh, a lot of. So, uh, I, and when I look at art stations front page, um, I see, I see technically really well done kind of art, but I do see a lot of exactly the same kind of stuff. But people are, mm -hmm. people are into um, anime. People are into um, sort of what I, I would call it uh, cheesecake kind of imagery. Uh, that sort of uh, generic attractiveness yeah. of characters, uh, a, a sort of generic view of science fiction environments where, where all the, all the futuristic cities, even when generated by, by, by real people, they tend to look roughly the same. Um, that, and that, it, takes, that takes the discussion more in, in a way towards social media and what gets clicks. But I think mm. that's a really pointed way to take it because in theory, we could actually think of AI and, and prompts as being the next social media Hmm. In, in a way of like, instead of getting clicks and likes, you're getting a lot of prompts that are requesting your style or a lot of prompts, a lot of ads are being kind of generated. And in art, you know, when, when we look at past art, when we were all disconnected, when there was no real connection between us as humans, African art had its own style and look and definition you know uh obviously you know the egyptian art is still famous to this day for its very kind of particular look and style uh the renaissance brought a whole bunch of new stuff uh, and back then we weren't clicking like we weren't you know it wasn't a whole bunch of humans going like oh i want to get more of this i want to get more of that it was just people doing something you know, with some very limited information of what could appeal to the people immediately around them. Social media kind of helped popularize a particular type of art, which I 100% agree with you, Anthony, has been, you know, if you just go on ArtStation, you'll see what that art style is. And that's basically the representation of the people clicking like in 
the world right now who have access to computers and like video games and anime characters mm. you know like it's it's a very small subset of earth right now it relatively small subset of earth we think it's the entire world it really isn't but uh we're seeing these and you know i hate to use the word but it's it is just the right word like these kind of ancestral um uh uh development of art of artist inspiring artist inspiring artist mm. looking for clicks rather than looking for just art for the for the sake of it um, yeah I, i'm i you see and, i'm not i don't i don't judge that kind of art in a way I, it, it might sound like i did in the way that i came across but uh, i think styles and, and and fashions and what people are into changes and and even before social media, everyone, uh, everyone in Europe and America probably were watching similar kind of Hollywood movies, watching the same kind of cartoons, uh, and, and, and still liking superhero movies and superhero comics back then as well. So they, they probably all like that kind of stuff. And I don't think there's anything inherently bad about that. I find it interesting yeah. that AI art sort of super spreads that out because it's taking something that's already a very mainstream um, tastes and flavors of what art is. And, it, and it's, it's spreading that even more. I, I would like it if it went the other way and I would almost want the AI to dream itself uh, and to see what, what does the AI think of when, when almost when you, when there is no human kind of prompt. I remember before mid journey came along, well, came along in, uh, to, in, in front of my kind of, um, my eyes there was a there was an app on on my phone called uh, wombo i think it was called or, and i think it's changed name a couple of times now and you could basically I've still got a couple of gifts from that, that was yeah really and you could fun. give it basically um a prompt and then you could give it an art style like a fairly generic art style, like christmas or um cyberpunk or something like that uh, and i think it was almost trippier and weirder and more interesting because it was the, the technology was almost more primitive and it wasn't as good understanding the prompt and so the results you got looked more like uh, a, a, a weird otherworldly kind of dream uh, but i think when you get something like uh, stable diffusion which is technically incredible and now can generate stuff that genuinely looks like a real photo um, it almost then becomes to me from a purely aesthetic artistic kind of point of view less interesting because uh, it's replicating photography now almost and um, and it's cheaper and it's more convenient and uh, and I can see see the appeal of it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I kind of want to see that, that the smaller, quirkier stuff. I'm more interested in that, I suppose, from a personal point. I of mean, view. I, I just I just want to jump in, though, because yeah, there was. Intelligent. Yeah, sorry, there was a there was a thing about how AI, you know, AI art hasn't got intent. And like, and I feel that's kind of discounting what I can see on, you know, especially in the, you know, the year of R&D that we've been doing. You know, there's actually sort of this emerging kind of. It's it's like a, it's like using a new tool. It's like it's it to me. It's like saying you know when artists started to use Photoshop and started to create digital art that you know well this is this is a tool that's you know it's not real art because it's digital and it's like I feel like actually you know when you when you're using artificial intelligence in all sorts of ways you know artistically speaking you know and i'm talking directly as a filmmaker here and earlier we spoke about you know using my knowledge of lenses and light flares and composition you know and, and then coupling that with ai artwork to create something that often feels like it came directly out of my head now you can always say well that you know where where are those images coming from i think all of us as artists are influenced by the imagery that you know you know, art is definitely imitating life and life is imitating art at this stage. And I don't think any of us know where that line is anymore, you know, and and I kind of feel like what AI is able to do, if used correctly, is create, it's a tool for a new style of artist to generate, you know, a, a kind of a, a new way of getting across their world point of view that existed in a way that they weren't able to access before. So I, I kind of feel like we shouldn't discount the power for, for AI art to, to kind of use somebody's knowledge base and, and help them generate a worldview that perhaps we haven't seen, that they wouldn't have been able to achieve traditionally. Sure. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, with the intent uh, comment um, was more like, 
it, without the human behind it, it, it's probably just like a random intent that's trained on one of those billions uh, images and you just get like a random version, like a random thing uh, from, from this big data set. Not that there isn't any intent uh, originally in those images. I, I'm just thinking if we, if we really use it as a tool and there's uh, someone really steering this AI towards like this intent or like this idea, uh, then, then I think it's, uh, it's definitely extremely helpful, but just, just like randomizing things and oh, yeah. uh, just looking at things that you like, it, it might not be uh, the, yeah, it doesn't really create this art that, uh, that you're used to. Uh, when when you do yeah it from, I, from scratch I guess I guess what it's doing is is I it's letting idea. yeah it's sort of letting people you know like traditionally artists will always be inspired by other art and will always you know reference or have that you know yeah. it's it's very hard as a as a director to go on set and not be thinking about those things that influence you to to you know want to make this thing and, and then try to find your own space within it I guess what AI art is allowing to happen is people with no artistic integrity. Who, you know, to simply replicate imagery that they are seeing. And it's kind of like Simon's point to some degree. I think you'll start to see the gap between genuine artists who are using AI and just people who are trying to replicate a fad that they've seen online. And that sort of, that sort of gap between the two will widen, I think, over the next year as more and more people use this. Yeah, I think yeah, on, on, got, on top I've... of that, I, oh, sorry, Kofi, uh, sorry. Yeah, I've got a question um, on YouTube from Ian Naylor. Um, he said um, that playing with the prompts here on Mid Journey for the first time, he's found that it's refusing to use certain words. And he's just wondering, what, what do you guys think about the AI protecting the artists from themselves? So you can, um, you can, you can tell that user that uh, using stable diffusion, he'll be just fine <laughs> using whatever words he wants to use. Um, right. Disco, uh, sorry, uh, Mid Journey in particular being a commercial product that uh, hides um, its model. So its model is not really public. They've actually implemented stable diffusion on top of what they've already uh, got, but their original model was never made public um, and um, was probably very much <laughs> inspired by ArtStation. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to you know, wager here. Okay. Um, and because they came out as a commercial pro product right off the bat, not an open source project, not a research project uh, in any way, shape, or form, I think um, they essentially just made a bunch of words uh, you know, unusable. Um, the reality of it is, is if you use any of the other models out there, you can put anything you want uh, in the, the search terms and and you'll get some horrible shit. I'm talking from experience here. It, it works. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I've, we've just added Davis. Davis is a VFX student. Um, he was watching us. So, oh, yeah, he, I think he, he's got... Um, some opinion. So yeah, if you can just tell us, yeah, yourself, about yourself and where you study and where you study. That'd be great. Um, my name is Davis. I'm a visual effects student at the Savannah College of Art and Design, and I'm pretty heavy into AI right now. I'm, I've played with Mid Journey and um, Stable Diffusion, Dolly too, um, but I really want to push the boundary and go beyond with um, like. 3D ML stuff. So hopefully merging some like deep faking with the diffusion models. Yeah, deep faking, deep faking is close, close to my heart. Actually, I've been playing around with that for quite a while. Um, uh, I've done a bunch of tests. Actually, there might be some on my LinkedIn if you check it out, like where I just <clears throat> made a very basic meta human version of myself and then deep faked it mm -hmm. with a model of my face. Um, I think deep fake is, is interesting. It also has very similar kind of concerns when it comes to, um, getting the, the, the rights 
uh, to use somebody's face in a certain way. Uh, there are a lot of question marks there. Um, all of the defects I've done have been using my and my friends' faces, so we're in the clear. Um, <laughs> but the uh, the the concern there when it comes to deepfake is yes, uh, uh, like we we live in a world right now where you could load up enough movies of a certain actor or actress and make them do whatever you want and create a video of it. The reason I'm not, and that's just me personally. Um, the reason I'm not that worried about the the morality of that side of things is that we've had Photoshop since the early '90s, um, if not late '80s. But and and everyone was saying, okay, you can now paste, you know, any <laughs> Spice Girl's face on any thing and you know the entire world is going to collapse because anybody could be put into a bad situation the reality of it is never happened because journalism can't just write off a single picture it also has to have uh people uh witnesses and and documents and things to prove that whatever photo you're showing is true so with deep fake it there is a weird kind of scary um, kind of uh, future world of like you anybody's face could be put in any weird situation but we've kind of already lived through that in the 90s with Photoshop mm. and it never really went anywhere um, when it I comes think I think with the deep fake stuff you know that it's got real commercial value you know again from a from a producing perspective you know for me to get anything greenlit so that I can be in a position to hire VFX teams, you have to cast bankable talent. And, and you would be shocked to find out just how tiny that list is. You know, there are actors that you would be convinced will, will land you a North American sale so that you can, you can fund your project. And they're, they're, they're worth nothing, you know, and this list is so tiny. And these actors are booked out nearly all the time. So that's why it's so difficult to see independent film getting made. But I think the deep fake stuff with AI is going to allow it, especially when you couple it with real time rendering and, and UE5 and stuff, is going to let us exist in a world where I can pay an actor to use their likeness, you know, and they'll have final say, but it's like, okay, I have a, a different artist in and we're using artificial intelligence to deep fake their face, to deep fake their voice on. And then they'll have approval of performance, but that essentially will get these films greenlit. So there, there is a world where actually this deep faking technology generates more greenlit movies, which means more work for all of us, you know, in theory. And, and, and do, do AI, does, does AI sort of, because there's, there's many companies and studios that are sort of using AI to generate information of what's going to be a successful movie <laughs> and... You know, they've got databases of like, if so and so's in this film uh, with a cast with somebody else, then there's a 75% chance that we're going to make a lot of money just because AI has learned what is a successful trailer or, you know, a successful, yeah. you know, type of movie. And let's just generate those type of movies, I guess. Where's that yeah. side of Yeah, look, AI you know, where the, scare, well, where the really scary thing. Like yeah, where the really scary thing is going to happen, Jamie, is, you know, a year or two from now, when all of these models are able to generate, you know, okay, this is a pretty good temp score. Okay, this is a pretty good, uh, you know, animated version of the film. You know, I think we're going to end up with where if you think about what a script really is, it is the most detailed text prompt that you could feed an AI on a project, you know. And so we're looking at a future where you're going, okay, we have a script we're deciding whether we're going to spend two and a half million dollars on this. Let's give it to the AI and then we'll watch the AI version of the film. And if it's no good, then we won't give them the money. And I, I think we are marching like at rapid yeah. speed to somebody essentially housing all of this stuff into one big umbrella and offering that as a service to companies like Netflix. I'm kind of now I'm saying it out loud, wishing that that's what I was doing because it feels like there's going to be a ton of money there. But you know, that is, that's where we're heading with this. And, that is going to make 
actual artistic integrity within movies very difficult when that comes along because you know first impressions on on a film is everything fun fun future films (laughs) yeah it's going to be it's going to be a real pain yeah and this is it but you know you're going to end up in a situation (laughs) yeah (laughs) you're going to end up in a situation where those bigger bigger movies are getting more and more homogenized and then there is this space for ai powered uh unreal engine real time using you know even in virtual production terms i can foresee very quickly where we're going to be able to generate something in stable diffusion like a a virtual production background in 2d feed it to something like google's infinite nature and within two clicks of a button like okay now i have a, a virtual set obj i can open up on a vp stage and off we go and i think that that kind of stuff is going to increase the market value of independent productions but it's still it's still going to make you know that this has to be somebody gatekeeping you know to try to make sure that people like netflix aren't ai generating whole movies to decide whether their value is in whether they get funded or not so i guess that's kind of where my vested interest comes right now in trying to steer that model in a direction where it's like yeah, this is just a handy tool that we use to sell the film in the first place without it becoming the point of the movie. Yeah, so that would be the, the mo- more detailed, descriptive, you know, writing to generate a trailer or a movie becomes the actual movie. Is I mean, I, I think I think it's going to be a depressing future for script readers when this kind of tech becomes ubiquitous in the next five years, let's say. You know, and you know you're not going to get your script greenlit unless you've written it in such a descriptive manner that it will generate a good AI temp film for them when they watch it to decide whether they're going to fund you or not. You know, and then it's going to make script reading like kind of this boring, arduous task where it reads like prompts. So, you know, this isn't just a thing that's going to affect the art world. It's 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 not already. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it is, but... (laughs) It's already terrible. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know, but this is, I, I guess that, in the, like, has, um... <laughs> that's an interesting argument you just said though, Simon, because in a weird, weird way, it ties back to what Anthony was saying earlier, where, you know, when your background is in art and or VFX, you know, you become very sort of like protective of the craft, mm-hmm. right? And when your background is a writer like me, you become very protective of the craft of screenwriting. But to a panel of VFX artists, it's like, that's the worst part of my job is having to read the script. It's so boring, right? And so, it, you know, I think AI is encroaching on all of those spaces. You know, there's no, there's just no way around it. And it's, it's okay. How do we, how do we keep yeah. some level of integrity in every department and make sure that we're actually using the AI to pay you guys more, not pay you less? So that's got to be the key to this. I think, I think a big key is, is definitely keeping people aware of what's happening um yeah. because the thing is is it's really easy for a 14 15 year old right now who's just getting into you know discovering what they like in terms of entertainment <clears throat> um to just you know potentially fall in a vortex of self-replicating ai stuff that yeah that wasn't that really didn't come out of the person it just came out of enough social media retweets enough uh you know ai is taking that in and then generating and generating more and then it's really easy for us as humans to just dig Mm -hmm. ourselves into a single thing because it's Mm -hmm. comfortable and that's what we like and that's why you know uh, some people might just like uh marvel type entertainment and then you try to show them an old French movie and they'll just immediately recoil without even watching the movie. They'll recoil immediately. They're like, I'm not going to like that. I know I'm not going to like that because I've spent most of my life liking this. Um, and the, 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 the main thing with AI is that it's going to accelerate the generation of that stuff. So, mm. you know, at the moment, um, you know, I, I know some people who love uh, scrolling comics, uh, these, these comics that are designed for phones and yeah. they're like, you know, uh, funny, whatever, like just, and they have a particular style. They kind of, they always have a style that, looks like that phone comic once the, 
that is probably the very first um, point of attack when it comes to AI. Uh, because it can oh, there's, there are some awesome AI comics Instantly. out there already. There's there's some AI comic books out there that are oh, great. But, you know, okay. Yeah, they're out there. I mean, I've, I think I've read like 25 this year that I was like, okay, that's actually pretty good. Um, I think the thing that we've got to, I think that conversations like this are super important. And I think that, you know, educating, you know, people who are aspiring to work in the arts, whether that is as concept artists or VFX or as film directors, like really educating them on on the power of using artificial intelligence to get their vision across is important because if we don't like you know the thing that worries me about ai is that 15 year old that you mentioned who gets stuck in their own echo chamber where they make one image with one prompt and yeah. that blows their mind and now they only work on variants of that prompt and so they never discover their artistic style that they would have discovered through trial and error, you know? And that's the thing I think that you can avoid as long as we're educating on, this is how you use AI to express yourself as opposed to get trapped within that art station echo chamber that, you know, that I think we're, I think is the thing we're all concerned about, yeah. you know? Yeah. Sure. As, 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 as Anthony, as a, as a lecturer with concept art and stuff, have you found like similar to what Tom's just says, interestingly, have you found any students kind of like, you know, using mid journey to generate an image that then sparks inspiration to go, okay, I've, I've combined Blade Runner with Mad Max. And then now I'm thinking, I've got an idea that's kind of amazing. I'm going to go off and do something for myself, not get stuck in that to, to use it as you know, prompt words to inspire themselves to then generate yeah. something manually. Oh, definitely. Yeah. That that I'm, I'm, I'm a lot. super, I'm supervising a, a, a final year student's project at the moment, and his reference uh, board that he's created for himself contains um, photography, film stills that he wants to to get, and but also some mid journey prompts of some landscapes that he wants to get. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're you know they're, they're using it, and I think that um, if we can somehow completely divorce the the ethics of how these things work away from that, and we just only talk about the practicalities of how useful it is, then yeah, totally. I mean, it it works like um, one of the techniques we would use to do, we'd get lots and lots of different photos, a little bit like I suppose the AI would do, and collage them together, and put all the crazy blending modes on Photoshop, and then do a little sort of window that you can look through. Very much, you know, when you look at the, you look at the clouds and you see castles in, in clouds and things like that. So they're using mid journey in that kind of way. And I can see how it's really useful in, in that way to use it right at the beginning to do that initial total blue sky kind of thinking. Mm. But I think then they come unstuck on as artists. And so not as directors, not as screenwriters or producers as, as actual visual artists is then how do they progress from that point? Um, once they've got that idea, what do they do? Do they do they then use that as if they just created reference and then they just traditionally do their art as usual? Or do they continue to try and um, manipulate and and, uh, and fine tune their prompts to get them what they want? Uh, you know, I, but it's so new. It's so new that this is the first mm -hmm. year that, that, that this has even slightly become something that, that students deal with. And, and I know that there are students using it in different ways, that one student is very much, she, she, she's very excited about it and she wants to make it the focus of her entire final year kind of project. And I'm interested to see what she does, but she's also very paranoid about it. She's also worried that will people judge her for doing, for doing it this kind of way. And, and, and I'm, I try and tell my students that, I mean, you're a student, so you're not doing any commercial work. So don't worry about that. It's not like, you're making money off of this. So you, you don't have to worry about that. Use it as an excuse to, to research it. You know, you're in academia. You can, you might as well think, uh, fulfill that kind of, that part of that task of being at university and, and research it and see kind cool. of how it works. I think as humans, um, when we care about the art that we're looking at, whether it's writing or photography or, or we, the, the people who care about the art intrinsically, they care about the effort sometimes more than they do care about what they're looking at oh oh yeah yeah i um, think that's that, that's a whole thing isn't it uh, the, the the process as an artist 
even if you're a commercial artist, even if you're doing stuff, a concept artist is, they're not like an artist with a capital A. They're not hanging stuff up in galleries. Uh, it is like a, it's part of the pipeline of, of the production. But there's still, the process of it is, is, is a big part of it. it, it it's, it's a pleasure in it. There's a, and you, and I think and you there's get like a, a dopamine when you get positive feedback. It's yeah. like, I've took, I've took me 10 attempts at creating this piece or this animation and the director's like blown away by yeah. it. And yeah. it kind of gives you that boost of kind of, whoa, that feels really good. And, and I, th I think that there's, um, I, think this I think that if you're not an artist and you, you see someone who's really good at art, they're a little bit like a little magical creature and you don't really know how they do it, but you're impressed. It's almost like a trick. It's almost like, were they born with talent or how hard did they have to work to kind of get this? And, and you, even if you're a director, even you're a producer, yeah, like you said, you, you know, you can tell a good bit of art that's had a lot of work put into it and, and that can't help but impress you. And I think then, but I think there's also a certain amount of envy that goes on. You know, when you see a magician do a trick and they're like showing off their, you, what's the trick? I, I want to know how it's done. And now AI will allow people to, who don't go through that process, who don't go through the years of hard work and boring practice, boring, boring practice of having to draw the same fundamental things to get good at it. Now they can kind of do it. They, they can do the trick as well. And I think it is, it's inevitable. It was always going to happen, but the way technology was going and uh, I find it fascinating to think about, but uh, I think uh, it, 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 you've got to remember we're dealing with humans. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, yeah. it's, it's a bit like, um, it's a tool. And I think in VFX, it's a great tool. Brilliant for doing all these things we talked about in Nuke and Houdini and Blender. But as an artist, it's like they were working in the car factory. And initially Photoshop was a brand new type of spanner that just did the car manufacturing better. So fair enough, you, you adapt with that. Then 3D comes along and now we've got another type of even better spanner that you can use. Uh, but now AI comes along and it's not a spanner anymore. It's, a, it's, it's one of those robots. And, and now the robot's making the car and you're really good at using the spanner, but you know, no matter how quick and, and brilliant you are with those spanners, um, may, maybe you've got to learn how to control the robot. But but you don't need as many yeah. people to control a robot as you do when you when it's just the people. And you know, and I, I don't want to be accused of oh, I'm against progress or anything like that. But uh, you know, it's going to have an impact. It is going to have an impact Carlo, on people. Carlo, that actually that's a pretty good segue into B two B, which is you know a lot of what you work on uh, and and a lot of what you work with. And um, yeah. when when you mentioned B two B. Um, and it, it might not be the right uh, thought to have at that point, but I did think of of uh, companies that sell stock images. Um, you let's not mention any yeah. names, but you know, stock companies. And when Midjourney first popped up, <clears throat> I have to admit that <clears throat> I immediately thought if if I had shares in a stock image company right now, I'd You'd probably pull them. <laughs> Because, yeah. um, because that's kind of their business model is to get artists mm. work like things that took a long time to make and then put them up for sale to a wider audience instead of just one to uh, a single buyer to a wide audience to then make it cheaper but generate more, hopefully, more money for uh, the artist that puts it out there. Um, mm. with AI requiring, requiring very little, little effort, it could either play into their hands where they actually decide to lawyer up and essentially just take over some of the market by creating custom models that nobody has access to uh, based on their own internal database. Um, taking everybody else who's used that database to make a model to court to make sure that they're not using anything that was on their stock website um, yeah. and then condense their power into that. It, 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 it condense their power more or, um, you know, if they don't catch up, it could all unravel before them. And essentially people will just use a service that can generate stock images and all of these uh, stock companies will just be kind of left out in the cold. Um, it, it, has that got any kind of, does that ring 
true to you or is there any... I would yeah. argue that... Well, I th oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think, I think, um, I think from, from my point of view, is if you're working for a, like a, like a big, a big company and they've got, you know, they've got their budgets, they always want to have something for as, you know, as, as cheap as they can and as quick as they can. So if they've got, if they can, um, come to someone and say, you know, we, because a lot of the time I have to sort of visualize an abstract, uh, you know, an abstract idea is not necessarily a product. It's it's something that they, as a company, you know, a service, they're not even a service, but, you know, the, the idea of the company and, and they want to sort of visually express that. So um, they might come to me for a bespoke set of images for a website or something. And I, I can see that maybe AI would, you know, someone in their marketing department, instead of writing an email to me with the brief, they could just write that into a into an AI you know, generator, and then they'd get what they what they want necessarily. But I suppose on the flip side of that, um, going to what Tom was saying about it being a tool, um, I couldn't do what I do now without the sort of technological advancement of things like Blender and Photoshop, because I can't draw as well. You know, I can't get the ideas out of my head and put them on paper with a pen. And so until digital came along, I couldn't do that. And a lot of people see that as a, well, that's not real art because you're, you know, you're, you're pressing a button, or you just, you know, using a mouse. It's so it's. I think I think common. everyone on this panel would agree that this is real art. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, I know now, but in some of the uh, industries that I've worked in, particularly because I, I came from um, like a really long sort of journey from shop floor to um, draftsman to you know to digital. So even when I went from you know doing drawings on a computer you know you'd get the old draftsman coming up and saying well you just press a button you know it's not I didn't think there was the same amount of work involved yeah. and I think it's kind of I think that's dropped off on digital art a lot now um you know people do recognize it as an art and it is difficult to do and I suppose with the AI now it can sort of take it back that way where you literally are just you know pressing a few buttons but you've still got to have the ideas haven't you yeah. you've still got to have that that idea to get something out of it yeah which is which it can't replicate for now i think for now but it's moving fast yeah uh Co yes. kofi uh how how are we doing for time just out of curiosity yeah i mean happy to conclude soon so um one thing because sorry <laughs> can yeah. i ask you something uh you 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 said um you you think like um yeah, stock footage sites are like in a bad position, but I, I would argue they are like in a really, really great position because they have the one thing that the AI needs, like the data set, which sets sets them apart from everything else. Because I mean, of course, like the scraped data sets uh, are maybe useful for research purposes, but if you have like high, if it goes into like higher quality images and generating like, 4k or 6k or whatever uh, i would argue that like um, stock images are like the best way to go without uh, watermarks and all this uh, stuff so um yeah. and i mean I, I don't know if you heard uh, that there's like uh, this partnering up from shutterstock and image gen uh, mm -hmm. and they uh, they actually yeah, going into the, um, maybe that's something to uh, discuss as well if, if we still have time if not, then don't worry. But uh, um, they, they actually pay their like certain amount if to to the uh, people who uploaded the images when when it's used for training for different prompts or something like this. I, I didn't go like completely in depth uh, um, of it, but but I I think for me it was interesting to to see that there's some reaction uh, to this. Yeah, um, I mean. Yeah, that that's that was my my thoughts exactly. They they're either going to to lose out or do mm. really well. And if yeah. they if they scramble fast enough to concentrate the power that they currently have, um, then they'll be fine. Um, but I'm sure a few of them won't be. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say though, I kind yeah, of agree anyway, with. Anyway, I... it, it is a story of the world. Yeah, I was going to say, I kind of agree with Justin in the sense that I think that 
weirdly, the, the stock sites might be the answer to some of the concerns that Anthony brought up earlier as well. Like, you know, and that you brought up, Simon, like, how do you financially, uh, you know, kind of look after the artist? And, and the thing with Shutterstock as a company is they already have this giant user base that are paying a monthly subscription fee. So they have like front end users. And they have the, the actual artists on site too. So, you know, if they only use imagery from their, from, you know, their own data set, then exactly that. If you generate an image using their, at the front end and we, and they specifically use your picture to train that image, then they have to pay you a royalty fee similar to Spotify to a musician. And I think that that is kind of the only functioning business model. That, that would look after both the front user and yeah. the actual artists that are being replicated. Yeah, I, I am not, probably not knowledgeable enough to know whether or not it's measurable. Um, like something like mid journey or, you know, disco diffusion, stable diffusion. If you type in a couple of prompts, you get a lot of random stuff and sometimes very unexpected stuff. How measurable are those biases um, that would probably take somebody a lot more knowledgeable than myself about how these uh, models are made? Um, it could be that a company like Shutterstock has to have a type of but like how how they can mechanically actually measure who gets what like like what, what if you just put like 20 artists name in inside your prompt and and looking at that resulting image and like what percentage of that image is for this artist and that artist and that artist that that becomes very complex i think uh, I, I think it'll end up it'll end up just being out. a Oh, it'll end up just being a flat fee for everyone it'll be like a flat fee where it's like okay everybody gets this flat fee you know and and it won't be as profitable as you know like it used to be maybe yeah i mean i would have used to have gone to the record store and, and happily paid 13.99 for 11 songs on an album now i get every song ever for 11 quid a month you know so it's like we're going to end up unfortunately in the same position where I can think like, yeah. like uh, art station will have their own AI. Yeah, I think we all know what he was saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah I, I was wondering. Uh, yeah. yeah go, on. go on, Tom. No, no, no. Go for it. Tom. The audio is doing that funny thing again. No, I don't know. I'll yeah, fix it. Just, just <laughs> <do that>. um. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was wondering just like how we have, end credits at the end of a movie would it be ideal for an image or the data set to include yeah, definitely, definitely. The, it's like it's interesting that you mentioned about the, the uh, shutter stock and stock images well, well they get credited um you know if if uh, if a publication uses uh, imagery then then you'll often see the stock photo provider credited underneath the, the photo in, in a journal or in a newspaper or something like that. And I don't think it's like, I think it's totally doable for them. If they can scrape billions of images, then I think they, and they know what URLs they're coming from, then I think they can probably figure out some way of credit. And I think that, I think credit, even without money, I think credit goes a long way. I think that there's something that yeah. stings about, about maybe seeing a bit of your art or something. And it's just not being credited. And it's and I think that the problem is I don't think the public really cares that much. Um, but I think artists kind of do care. Uh, and um, and I don't think that it would be too difficult for them to do that. I just think that, you know, that people are unwilling to credit sometimes because they, they don't want to sort of dilute their vision. It's my vision. I came up with the prompt and I don't really want necessarily all the credit there. I mean, and in taken to the the most cartoonish kind of level is, is um, sorry, I'm going to mention it. He's going to come up at one point. He's going to come up. Elon Musk um, is that he, he, he infamously said uh, that he would never credit any kind of art that he found on Twitter. In fact, artists shouldn't be credited. And, and obviously that, that rankles artists an incredible amount, but I think a lot of people say they either agree or they just don't really care, but I think it, it wouldn't hurt to put the credit on. And I think that um, 
I found it puzzling that people don't want to credit people. I, I suspect I've got my armchair psychiatrist suspicion of why that might be, but I'm not trained enough. Because I mean, to say Kofi for sure. <laughs> would would agree. Kofi, when you, when we've worked on like a movie and maybe we've done like a week's work of like cover on I don't know a big movie and mm-hmm. you don't get credited. It's that type of like, what, how much do you need to work on it to get credit? Because mm-hmm. if you if if I've worked on a shot and it's took me a week, and, and like you know, yeah. like a post office shot or a previous, and it's pretty much that that shot when they've shot it, yeah. but you didn't work on it for four months, so you don't get credited. I guess that's like yeah. similar, you know, how much percentage yeah. justifies how much credit that person gets? Because even like one week's worth of work should be recognized i know the public won't care but you as an artist when you're watching it going that week was like hard graft surely yeah. it'll be cool to just get that recognition and just yeah. have a little name and but, at the very least yeah. some you know you can cram so much text into metadata you know at the very least you know it should be required to be in metadata um mm-hmm. you know i know that like social media they just they scrape metadata out so that's not going to work if you're posting on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever, you know, um, I have my own opinions about all these companies, but the, the reality is like, if, if you can't cram an entire massive prompt, uh, at the bottom of an image, which sometimes can be a little bit unrealistic, I guess, because they can get really long, uh, if you get very convoluted about it, um, potentially, you know, at least isolate artist names. You know, so you don't need to credit a house in a prairie with a cow, you know, but but at least mention if there's an artist name that's in your database as a recognized artist. Um, obviously, a lot of people have the same names, so that could be problematic as well. But um, I, I agree in that, like, Anthony, you make a very good point that, like, you know, Shutterstock will still have a little Shutterstock logo at the bottom of an uh, image on of buzzfeed you know on the buzzfeed front page you'll still have that little from from shutterstock um or courtesy of i think if buzzfeed starts generating most of their images from ai uh, i think it's fair game to expect them to at least uh mention the artists that they used in that prompt if they use any artist if they just say i want to you know a mouse on a bicycle then fine Fair game, whatever. But but if they go, I want a mouse on a bicycle in the style of a current artist, struggling artist, then they should mention that name. But do certain artists want to be credited if if it's like a like some other artist doing their work? Because I, that, I <laughs> yeah, sorry. Actually, you make a very good point. So I have a very good friend uh, whose name I won't mention, but he he designed a very famous throne let's just leave it at that he designed a very famous throne in a series that a lot of people have watched um and when before me journey kind of became public he was getting a lot of twitter mentions um and it was art that looked inspired by his art but it always said by his name and because it was getting added, he would get, he would get mentioned, and then he'd just be like, "I didn't do that," it, and he didn't like it. He absolutely hated everything that was being generated. He thought it looked terrible. He was like, "I would never paint that. I didn't make that." But everyone on Twitter thinks that I'd done that, uh, and he was he's still very angry about this stuff. Um, and so yeah, just to make a very not his point. Yeah. intention to create yeah, this image so yeah yeah <laughs> in some way it's not of, happy yeah <laughs> yeah 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 that's, that's a good point yeah all right so i guess yeah we can we can sum it up and yeah i guess my last question is can we live with it <laughs> well, i don't think we've got a choice yeah we've got we've, <laughs> yeah inevitable i'd say yeah <laughs> All right. Isn't the project well, a bit too too fast for us? I mean, as a humans, we've got certain capacity of absorbing absorbing stuff. 
I mean, now is okay, but in five years, probably AI is gonna be maybe ten times as as more powerful as as today. So, and, and will it deflate us as humans to think that? Oh, what's the point in learning that? Because yeah. next week, exactly. It's for, it's I think we all just have to hope that the the AI keeps a few of us in a zoo for <laughs> prosperity, and you know, looks after those that are left. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they can use this as batteries to power. Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. I feel like that's quite a good film, possibly. That could, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's type let's type it up, Tom, and let's let's pitch that. I've I've, I've just told the AI script writer to generate that one. Just as our intent. There we go. Get get a buyer. <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> well, yeah, it's been it's been a great discussion, and yeah, so thank you guys for for the time and for for sharing your your thoughts. My pleasure. Thank you, Kofi, for pulling pleasure. it together. Yeah, thank you. It was awesome. Cheers. Awesome really nice to, to chat you with you all. Well. Yeah. yeah. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you guys. <laughs> bye, guys. Good night. Bye, everyone. See you guys. Bye, bye, bye guys. See ya. Bye. Bye.